A um, few words of welcome in French. Bonjour et bienvenue à la journée franco-italienne des gens chercheurs 2022. Um, nous, l'association Bernard Grigori, l'Université de Turin, l'Université franco-italienne sont très ravis de vous accueillir aujourd'hui. Um, donc, nous allons démarrer uh, d'ici quelques instants. Bonjour, uh, un salut italien, bienvenue. Uh, siamo contenti, vi ringraziamo per aver aderito a esservi iscritti alla giornata, all'edizione del 2022 della giornata franco-italiana dei giovani ricercatori e fra qualche minuto inizieremo. Vi ringrazio da parte dell'Università di Torino, dell'Associazione Bernard Gregory di Parigi e dell'Università Italo-Francese che ha la sede a Grenoble e a Torino. So the event will be moderated by Lucia Salto, Career Development Facilitator for PhDs at the University of Turin, and myself, Christina Bierke, Training and International Project Manager at Association Bernard Grigori. The program will consist of three parts, our tips of networking practices, um, followed also by a short break, Then the round table with representatives of French, Italian, and also European companies and organizations. And finally, a round table with PhD holders who work in the French Italian space, but also internationally. So we invite you to introduce yourself in the chat box and tell us um, what country and also institution you are from. Um, And uh, for the official opening, I'm pleased to welcome Gael Caldera, coordinator of the French Italian University, Eleonora Bonifacio, Dean of the Doctoral School and the University of Turin, and Meliki Reole, Head of International Cooperation at ABG. Please, uh, we will start with Gael. Thank you, Christina. Uh, I'm sharing my presentation with you. So just oh. one second. No, excuse me. Christina, I think he had avant the greetings of the doctor of our doctoral school. Do you want me to stop, maybe? And... Yes, please. Okay. Oh, well. Okay, please go, go first. Okay. Sorry. Okay, so I'm sharing again my presentation with you. Just a second, please. Now I think you are, yes, you see my presentation, right? Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, did you know that the French-Italian uh, Day for Early Career Researchers has awarded the French-Italian University label for the second year? That's a label for um, a quality label for French-Italian projects with high cultural and academic value. So congratulations for uh, the organization of this event. I am Gaël Calda, coordinator of the French-Italian University Thank you for being here with us today. I thank the Association Bernard Grégory for the invitation at this important event for young researchers in Europe. Just a few words about uh, the French-Italian University. It promotes the relations between French and Italian researchers, groups of researchers, and especially young researchers. Uh, it's very important for us to keep strong relations and active collaborations between our two research communities. Uh, and the involvement of young researchers is uh, really encouraged in our programs. Be the future of the European research. Uh, in, uh, at the French Italian University, we have um, six annual or biannual calls for different types of grants. For instance, we have grants for master's double degree programs. We have also three year scholarships for PhD students in joint supervision. We have postdoctoral research grants, uh, grants for international mobility of researchers, of visiting professors. There is also, also the label for uh, conferences, seminars, cultural events. 
publications, traductions. And finally, we have two award programs. Um, just one more thing, if you need more information about uh, the French Italian University and our programs, you can visit our website. Do not hesitate to contact me if you have any questions. Here is my email address and the email address of my colleagues in Torino. Thank you very much for your attention. I wish you a good event and a pleasant day. And I will hand over to Christina. Thank you very much, Kael. Um, just to check that um, the chat box should now be working. And um, for the opening, we will continue with Eleonora, please. Okay. First of all, uh, thank you for inviting me. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here to this afternoon for um, to give my greetings uh, for to this event. I think that uh, this kind of uh, event can give an idea to PhD students or PhD holders of uh, what happens next. And uh, um, in such a world that becomes uh, smaller and smaller every day, I think that this uh, event uh, um, that point to the cooperation between uh, researchers of different countries should really be the rule in the future. I am uh, uh, Eleonora Bonifacio, as you know from the, uh, the label, <laughs> and I'm the director of the uh, PhD school of the University of Torino. This PhD school is quite big because it includes, uh, it groups uh, um, PhD courses going from humanities uh, to STEM disciplines. So uh, I'm uh, really glad that uh, uh, today um, you will have the opportunity, thanks to the organizers, to listen to the experiences of uh, people coming from very different fields of, uh, of studies. So I'm sure this will be a really fruitful afternoon and I hope that you um, PhD students and PhD holders will get very useful tips for a bright career in, in the future. I, I want to thank really much the organizers of this event such uh, which are Cristina Berkut and uh, Lucia Salto, to, uh, as well as uh, uh, the French Italian University and uh, the other organizing parties. Thank you very much for inviting me and have a nice time. Thank you, Nora. Thank you very much, Christina. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I would like to take this opportunity to present uh, really quickly ABG and how we can be helpful to the audience. So uh, students, researchers, uh, but also institutions and recruiters. So ABG is a French nonprofit organization dedicated to career development and recruitment of um, uh, doctoral students and uh, PhDs, especially outside academia. So we have three main activities. The first one is recruitment. Uh, on our website, we have a job board uh, with uh, offers uh, for internship opportunities, thesis topics, but also uh, job opportunities in and outside academia for all fields. Uh, second, I, uh, we also help, sorry, companies uh, recruit uh, PhDs. Second activity would be trainings. So we give trainings about different aspects of career development, uh, career planning and job search strategy uh, for PhD candidates and PhDs. Uh, third activity is information. So on our website, uh, on, on our social media accounts, uh, through the events that we organize, 
uh, we give information about mobility opportunities, funding opportunities, testimonials from PhDs who uh, changed paths or testimonials from recruiters to explain uh, why they want to work with PhDs. So all these activities in France and uh, at the international level, especially in Europe, um, so cross-border activities are especially important for us because research by definition is international and uh, researchers are uh, mobile. And uh, we organize several events, uh, physical on-site events or webinars, uh, workshops, career workshops also with partners, uh, for example, from Germany, Luxembourg, UK, uh, North America. Uh, so these events are very useful in terms of uh, information, but also in terms of networking opportunities. So I hope that uh, this second French-Italian day for early career researchers uh, will be the same. It will help you uh, answer some of your questions and provide you with uh, information, but also collaboration and networking opportunities. So I would like to thank again uh, all our partners, the speakers, uh, but also the participants for being here. And I give the floor back to Christina. Thank you very much, Melke. Thank you very much, uh, Nora Gael, for this opening ceremony. Um, before our main part, which is uh, two round tables, there will be also um, a short intervention on networking and the important, importance of the networking. Um, I will share my screen. Um, also, um, a quick message to um, participants. So please don't hesitate to ask your questions in the Cure and R sections, and uh, we will try to reply to as many as uh, of your questions as possible. So really don't hesitate. And of course, uh, you are more than welcome to chat uh, among yourself in the chat box. So thank you for the ones who are presenting, introducing uh, themselves. Please continue doing so. We are reading your introduction, even if we are not um, reacting to this, but uh, it's um, nice to see all participants from uh, different countries, cities um, taking part in this event. So, about this, sharing the screen. Um, so why networking? Um, well, first of all, the overall theme of this second French-Italian day um, is to show the benefits, first of all, of networking, and also to create um, a meeting space, meeting space with company uh, representatives and PhD holders who are now working in social um, economic sector. So what networking is about, just to be sure that we share the same um, meaning. It is, first of all, about making connections, meeting people that will lead you to some point meet other people, whether it's virtually or physically. And of course, um, we can help you implement your career plan. And that someday you can help also others as well in implementing of their career plan. Um, so here's a question for you to answer in the chat box. Do you network? How? With whom? Um, how do you feel about networking? So please your answer, please put your answer um, in the chat box. Um, so how do you find networking? Is it difficult for you? Do you network? How often? Um, and have you ever tried it before and in what context? So please, um, I will be waiting for um, a short moment to see also your answers on your networking practice. So I'm checking on some of your answers. Networking is good, but part of the work should remain in person. Yeah. Try my best. 
but it becomes hard when you don't know the local language. Okay, the linguistic part. Taking to Quest lecture at university, talk to fellow researchers around the lab. Okay, when you do it, internships, great. Networking is essential, wonderful. Networking uh, has comes and pros, of course, in different culture. There's that's important part also to take into consideration the cultural codes while networking. So uh, thank you for these first reactions. Of course, there's many, many uh, reflections or um, shall I do networking or not? Um, sometimes there is, could be also feeling that, well, networking is good for someone, but personally, I want to be evaluated on my own merits or um, People are usually too busy. I don't want to bother them with my uh, questions or um, I have my pride. I don't want to owe anything to anyone or it's maybe um, culturally, once again speaking, it's not a common practice, for example, in my country or even in my sector. Um, but actually when you change the perspective, Let's imagine if someone uh, get in touch with you and um, try to, to ask for advice, how would you react if someone asked for information? So I bet you would agree to help. So um, in networking, consider yourself as an expert in your field. You are not just the person in demand of information. You can also give your knowledge in return, your knowledge, or let's say also a satisfaction of helping someone. Um, this is really a win-win situation about benefits um, and why networking is important. First, through the meeting of people working in a company or in position that interests you, you get ideas and tips um, on how to develop your career plan. And while transitioning from, let's say, um, academia to private sector, it's very much important to know exactly what is expected. Uh, and also uh, trying to check whether a company or a job matches you or not, because you're also recruiting your job and your company, then um, you would know exactly what is expected from you as a candidate. If there, for example, a similar position open and you would know exactly which skills and experience you, um, you must put forward. So you can also identify opportunities that are not yet publicized or not yet created just by speaking with um, people, with company representatives, and maybe also by identifying their needs. Plus, if you're recommended by someone, um, there's a reference. Um, so your application will have more weight and there are better chances of having a recruitment interview. So networking is not a way to ask for a job. It's not, it's a way to get insightful information and get visible in a professional circle by also being a professional. Um, so some ideas on how can you grow your network First, well, the, the ideas that some of you already mentioned is to care about activities of your colleagues and people you meet in your lab. For example, salespeople, company representatives um, that are also in touch with your lab, um, some um, research fellows, uh, postdoctoral researchers, um, they might be also um, have some previous experience in the company. You would never know without chatting with people. 
There's also um, a good way in attending or organizing professional events, whether it's conferences, some meetings, uh, job events or seminars. So you have plenty of uh, different formats to, to try to get uh, in touch with people and also to get visible. Another option would be uh, be a part of a professional networks, uh, whether it's student network, alumni, uh, for example, of, from your former school, university, or from your extra professional activities. You do sports, you do some art activities, for sure you can meet some interesting people there. Um, also give visibility to your own activities. Um, for example, explaining your activities to your car network on LinkedIn, or also by, particip by, by participating in forums or um, in different discussions in, in these groups on LinkedIn once again. And the biggest part would be uh, leading networking interviews with professionals. So this can be contacts of your contacts. Um, for example, using um, also a, a simple keywords search on the internet or on LinkedIn by checking on interesting pro profile um, in some themed groups uh, that are similar to your profile or who are now occupying positions that you are interested in. Of course, these ones are just few ideas and you don't have to do all of this at once in the space of one week. Of course, be selective and start by things you're comfortable with. And also um, always try to uh, settle your goals according to what your main goal is. For example, for now, uh, you're still uh, on research contract, but you would also like to know about other opportunities. So little by little, uh, by meeting people, you advance also in your networking goals. Um, there's some golden rules um, that you can follow that also can help you to, um, to be comfortable in this networking approach. First, recommendation. Recommendation or references. So um, it's very much useful in expanding your network. For example, start with people you know your PI or your colleagues and ask them whether they could recommend you someone who, for example, now is working in a company or maybe also try to identify some elements in common. Maybe you um, follow some similar trainings, but you're not exactly from the same class. If we're talking about the alumni network, or uh, you have some common professional interests, um, whether it's a, for a profession, a theme, or a sector. And uh, if you're a PhD candidate or already a PhD holder, remember that PhD is a great key, a great element, element in common to get uh, in touch with other PhDs, because for sure they, they've been there, they know how it is to translate from academia to private sector. Another rule would be reciprocity. Networking is always a win-win process, but it doesn't require the re reciprocity in a two-way. So it's more like a circle. A helps B, B helps C, C uh, will one day help A. So don't worry about this feeling that what can I give in return? Once again, sometimes it's just a pleasure to share the information to be useful for someone. And from there goes another rule is professional to professional uh, relations. So of course you have to adapt positive attitude, it will be up to you to lead the discussion among colleagues. But once again, your colleagues. And of course, some tips on effective communication, um, such as um, simple presentation, 
in a very clear and concise way when you explain your background and what do you expect from your interlocutor. So when your request is clear um, and when you have the right approach, usually it often works. In networking, it works. Um, also some ideas um, on information you can get from this networking discussion. Usually ask, try to, to mention some open questions. Show your interest in person, in their background. Um, and of course, collect some useful information for you about work, about sector, about market tendencies, but also skills needed. Um, salary, very much important question. And vocabulary, it's a very rare information. And for example, if prior to applying for a company position, you've always been in academia. So of course you use some academic vocabulary which is often not similar to what uh, is common for the companies. And uh, another thing that you can also ask is a new contact to meet. Once again, networking is about meeting people. So one important element would be also whether the person could recommend you another person to help you in advancing in your um, career plan. So there's this short to-do list. And of course, once again, you will have to adapt uh, it uh, according to your main goal. First, really small goals. For example, at events, limit yourself to two or three contacts in the evening. You don't have to chat with the whole uh, room of people. Or, for example, one networking interview every two months. And of course, choose professionals who have, um, let's say, three to five years of experience prior to yours. So someone who's still in junior position and uh, who still remember <laughs> how it feels to be uh, a fresh PhD holder wondering what shall I do next. On LinkedIn also, uh, for example, share your content, some PowerPoint presentation, videos, articles, posters. It could be just once per week, but always um, explain why you decide to share this information. And then also try to join some relevant groups and participate in discussions. Another thing will be prepare your pitch. So pitch is a short presentation of who you are. And uh, there's some um, easy and simple things to, to be aware of. First, try to articulate your name and position so your interlocutor could remember who you are. Then what you do. So present simply and clearly your background. And what you're looking for. Are you looking for information or advice? And of course, this part will depend on the context. Then uh, when you know ahead, who you might meet at networking event or for a networking interview, of course, search for information to prepare relevant questions. After that, of course, keep in touch with your network. Follow uh, their career development, um, congratulate them, uh, send them uh, some news, ask for news. So it's tiny things that will help you to stay in touch. So um, it is also important to understand that you have to leave networking. It's not just um, something that you do prior to find a job position. It's really your life, your style life, uh, lifestyle, sorry. Uh, something that you do on a daily basis. And of course, uh, 
it also will come with practice. So practice, network, network, and LinkedIn. LinkedIn is very much important in, in networking. You'll see how easy it could go um, in this, uh, in expanding your network and maintaining contacts through LinkedIn. So now it's your turn. Use also the French Italian day as an opportunity of networking. Um, we will have um, a little bit time for your questions. I see there's some questions and also reactions in uh, discussion. I so, can read, I can yes, read please, them please, for you. Yeah. Networking is very important for my part. I'm starting to have small network, but through conferences. Uh, it's good. So um, just to comment on that, conferences is great. Um, some conferences also invite some industrial partners. If your goal is to go to this private sector, so just focus maybe on this part. Well, if you want to stay in academia, so it's good. I think networking, uh, Monia Ben Hivda, is important. I think networking is important, especially nowadays, but it is not always easy to initiate the conversations or ask for advice. It's, it's difficult, it's true, at the beginning. It absolutely is. And if one day you will meet someone who will say, oh, I'm so great in networking. It's so easy for me. And I feel very much comfortable by meeting new people and asking them for, ad for advice. Don't trust this person. No, of course, well, <laughs> networking is a muscle. Networking is a skill. So it um, goes easily with practice. Sometimes, um, yeah, try to approach maybe um, the, the person who are also alone, the person who, uh, or maybe to smile you if we're talking about the events or if we're talking about LinkedIn. So someone who has a similar background. So you will feel more comfortable also by in explaining why you decided to get in touch with this person. The person will also be able to understand your request um, easily and to reply positively to your request. And little by little, you will find your own way how to network, how to um, also um, um, approach people. What will be your own tips on that? So little by little, what is comfortable with you? Try to, to do this. Is there small comments? In general, I make moderate networking. Sometimes I struggle to find ice breaking words. <laughs> what do you mean by ice breaking words? Something, something smart to say or uh, in networking sometimes the like the easy chat would be the the most simple and good idea to do. So of course you um, don't think about networking as something where you have to impress people. It's too much pressure for every one of us. If we go on networking events, say like, I need to say something good, something smart, something that, um, that people would be able to recall me on me, on my background, well, sometimes it's, um, it creates too much stress and under stress, well, we have this tendency maybe to forget some important information, for example, even to say uh, what our name is. So just relax and do small chat like, hi, why are you here? Like, or with what company, with what institution? Leila Pichy, it's my biggest problem. I have a problem to make network. So the problem is what? Could you repeat, Lucia, please? It's my biggest problem. I have a problem to network, to, to network. Probably it's, it's difficult. Maybe yeah. she, she must be shy. Yeah, yeah Leila, could, could you develop on this? Um, and at the same time, I see also the, the comment from Stefano, this 
some people say it's natural and networking. Once again, in my opinion, it's just because they practice a lot. Um, they have this tendency maybe they to uh, be present in um, networking events. But once again, you have to start somewhere by approaching maybe, yes, junior profiles, by asking like, why are you here? Right. Or um, introducing yourself. So, um, or if there was some, um, let's say um, a talk, like uh, a conference prior, a quick question. So what do you think about the conference we just uh, heard? just so or like the really easiest uh, way to start a conversation uh, for example is if there a cocktail around about food oh it's a nice uh i don't know canapes around did you try this one or that one really something easy um also about uh staying in touch with people it's true that sometimes it's where a way easy to create a new contact, then um, maintain these contacts. And um, in time of the effort you will put in it, it's um, of course it's more um, more time uh, consuming, but it's something that very um, useful one day and. Um, you will also find a comfortable way of doing this. So for example, I show, I mentioned LinkedIn. So if you have a profile on LinkedIn, just, oh, I hope you you all have a profile on LinkedIn and that your profile is up to date. Um, ask if you can uh, add the person on LinkedIn and sometimes check on the information and you will see that when we share common interests or, and especially if we're coming from the same sector, there's actually some useful information for you. Or maybe you were discussing some um, new trends in, uh, in the chemistry, and then you saw some article um, similar to what you've been discussing with your interlocutor. Why not to send this article sharing, saying that, oh, I just saw this article and I found this interesting or what we've been discussing about uh, new materials and so on. This is just a random example. But really, you don't have to imagine uh, a very complex way to get in touch with person. Sometimes the easiest way, the most simple, is what works better. There's a, some commentary. For example, um, as a fresh, um, uh, I struggle keeping in touch with people. Any suggestions? Yeah, well, once again, LinkedIn really, uh, um, it's what I'm using. And that's why uh, I'm also uh, advising of LinkedIn. It's like uh, your, uh, you know, your agenda, your, uh, uh, all your contacts, you can see, also, it's a way to catch up with people. Of course, we cannot follow uh, each day the career growth of the whole network we have there. But from time to time, checking whether, oh, like this, this person now is working in a new company or a new position. Also, what is good with LinkedIn um, is that um, you receive sometimes quick notification where there's something new. So it's also the way to, to get in touch. Uh, whether you are a member of a LinkedIn group, be visible there, launch a discussion. Um, really, um, it's it's the easiest way. Of course, then if you have, um, if you're more uh, phone call person from time to time, you can call, but what I see, what I uh, also hear from uh, different um, PhD holders that will now like, let's be uh, transparent, <laughs> who are using uh, phones nowadays. So like, usually it's like uh, video platforms like Zoom or others or LinkedIn and then some 
um, other platforms, but less email, less uh, phone calls. So um, by, uh, don't think about this professional social uh, media as something very time consuming. Think about this as a gadget that actually helps you. And this is actually what it does. Um, I find people more natural, natural in networking. It's true. It is true. Yeah, well, I already commented on this. Um, well, just it's mm -hmm. the practice. They like fake it until you make it. And uh, yeah, well, this is what I invite you to, to practice, like create an event even here. So um, in, um, in a few minutes, you will meet some um, company representatives and also PhD holders. Well, get in touch with them and then you'll see what, what what's going on, whether, whether, whether they will be open to a discussion and how it goes. But usually people are nice. So even if uh, you know that you're less comfortable, less natural in networking, it's fine. No one will say, you. oh, you don't look natural. I don't want to, to network with you. No, of course not. The people anyway, if, you, if they see that you're a little bit stressed or uncomfortable, they will help you. Well, at, at least I hope so, that you will network with nice people who will also encourage you in this practice. The issue is that we are we have always learned that we must show that we are already aware about the company or the team. It makes confusion with just spontaneous discussion with the uh, just spontaneous discussion. Well, um, let's say if it's a very tiny topic, a discussion where they're just company representatives, maybe yeah. Of course, you cannot. Uh, mention some names or some new products because you're not aware, but be transparent, be clear and with your goals. It's fine to say that I'm just, uh, uh, I'm a researcher, I'm a PhD holder, and I'm interested in your company. And it's true that I have a background in academia, but I'm sure that my skills could be useful for the private sector also. And I'm just trying to figure out how uh, and uh, on what projects you are working. So when you pretend to say like, oh, um, for example, if your interlocutor tells you, so I'm from uh, Total Energies, and you will pretend, oh yeah, I know your company, I know all your projects. In this case, yeah, later or sooner, the person will uh, notice that, oh, actually the, <laughs> the person doesn't know much. And it's just the, um, the expectations that are not met. But if you acknowledge that, oh, well, of course I heard about your company, but I don't know exactly whether you uh, hire PhD holders, whether there's a place, what your projects exactly um, is about, uh, be transparent. It's totally fine for you especially while transitioning, not know like these professional sectors, trends and so on. So you are there in these events and you are approaching these people to learn. But sometimes it's just the question of clear request. So when you specify that you're here to get the information, of course, no one will say, well, how it's possible that you don't know our projects and our partners. So I know that networking is the very huge topic. Um, I would really encourage you uh, practicing this um, and especially like uh, in a few minutes also continue being present, commenting on and uh, asking your questions. Um, so uh, now we will do a short break. I know that well, I will read all of your comments and uh, if you have some more questions afterwards on networking approaches, of course, you're uh, very much welcome to um, get in touch with me for more advice. So uh, now we will, be, we will go on break, a 15 minutes break, 
And then we will continue with the first round table with company representatives. So okay. stay with us and see you in even 14 minutes. Tu me complément, Christina, tu étais très efficace. <laughs>
Buongiorno Simone. Buongiorno. Buongiorno. Stavo guardando, siete solo in due, mancano ancora, ah no, tre, quindi manca Stellantis e, e Cristina, tu avevi sai il Zoom con Carlo Barbera? E se marche, se la marche. Ok, allora il faut attendre. Uh, Rossan Brachet è là, Simona Campolongo è là, Simona Olgiati, quindi un attende Estelle Blandin e Carlo Barbera. perché ho caricato il mio sfondo ma lo vedo speculare voi lo vedete giusto? aspetti che guardo eh, sì, sì, si vede giusto sì, sì. Ah, ok allora deve essere zoom che mi fa vedere l'immagine anche io lo vedo specchio. al contrario sì sì penso che sia ma che... Ah, Cristina noi abbiamo un, un ecran un po' differente we have a little bit different virtual screen maybe I don't know I Oh, it's it's fine, like or it's still okay, the, the, it's the, the French Italian day, just you know, not to be uh, too flashy. The I don't know. I, I I received this one and I uploaded this one. Me too. There, there have nice been uh, up to now lots of questions, so our PhD are quite interactive because they are writing in the chats. The, 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 it was about networking, difficulties encountered in network. Cristina was very good. So now, five minutes, still five minutes. Yeah, still five minutes. So, um...
Bonjour. Hello. So we are all there. Buongiorno, bonjour. Hello. 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 Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Just a yes, quick yes, chat of the of all cameras, all mics. So I also hoping that before Lucia you um, give the floor um, to invite all participants to be back to, to your screens for this round table discussion with company representatives um, that is now starting. Hello everybody. So we started in time. Let's get started with uh, the second part of our Franco-Italian Day uh, for Early Career Researchers. Let me first um, express my gratitude. My gratitude goes to all the panel the panelists uh, um, who kindly accepted our invitation. So, and uh, since it is a Franco-French-Italian Day, you know, uh, it, it was all all. It was very well balanced, and uh, I think that this 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 round table is also, as you can see, a representative of big companies, uh, uh, medium-sized company, and so startup. So different realities and uh, offering possibility, opportunity to early career researchers. So you are also uh, you, are, you you are PhD. So uh, you you perfectly know the meaning of a, the value, the plus of a PhD, and maybe the, the, the pros and cons difficulties encountered when uh, you start a career in non-academic context. So let's start. Thank you very much to Roxanne Brachet, PhD in public health and epidemiology, research and platform department at Grenoble Biocluster, France. And uh, thank you. Uh, if you, you can very briefly, um, introduce yourself, um, tell, tell us something about your background, your current position, uh, what are you expecting uh, from PhD, uh, for which position you are recruiting PhDs, and thank you for giving us also a key final key message. Roxanne, are you here? Otherwise, let's maybe continue with Carla. So maybe also, maybe she, she was there before, maybe she's, I, I hope, hopefully she has no technical problems. So anyway, so we start with Carlo Barbera, um, PhD in biomedicine, senior project manager, corporate research and development, Alpha Sigma, an important pharmaceutical company. Uh, everybody knows it, so he is himself a PhD, so, so he perfectly knows uh, <clears throat> the meaning of, for a researcher deciding to, to, to move to other sectors. So, and thank you for, for your presentation, uh, your concise presentation, because we have lots of questions for you. Thank you. Sure, thank you very much. And I'll be very quick. So my name is Carlo, Carlo Barbera. Uh, I'm a scientist by training because I graduated in biotechnology and I've got a PhD in biomedicine, virology specifically. And uh, as Lucia said, I'm currently a senior project manager for corporate research and development at Alpha Sigma, uh, which is, yes, one of the largest Italian pharmaceutical companies. So we have little time, so I want to go straight to the point. Uh, why industry wants or should want PhDs and what makes PhDs different from other professionals? Well, I, I think the answer is that we live in a very complicated world. And uh, uh, if we didn't realize it before the pandemic, uh, now I think it's crystal clear to everybody that we cannot keep on doing things the way we used to do it before. Uh, so we definitely need people who are trained to think. Uh, who are used to make themselves difficult questions and who are used to try to answer those questions. Uh, so in short, what industry wants from PhD? They want your brain. 
They want your critical thinking. They want your ability to think outside of the box and uh, to find new solutions to new challenging problems. And this is, I think, what really makes PhDs different. Their creativity, their ability, and also their habit to innovation. I think it's just simple as that. From my point of view, I think it's very important to forget about the hard skills. Hard skills are, have been recently dead, I think. Uh, if you haven't already worked for a project that are of company or a corporate interests, I don't think that's a big problem because again, it's the way of thinking that company should or want to buy. Uh, it's what you can or are will, willing to be able to do with your soft skills and, and not what you've done in the past. I mean, not strictly what you've done from the hard skills point of view. Uh, now, uh, I've been asked also to, to talk about the, the recruitment process in, uh, in our company, but um, I, I don't want to bother you with the details of the recruitment process. I would like to give you maybe some advices about how I think you can get your foot into the door uh, of the industry. And from my perspective, uh, there are three uh, main critical factors to do that. And these are preparation, preparation, preparation. Mm -hmm. Why do I stress this factor of preparation? Uh, because the most successful, I think, factor to to get your foot into the industry is to be prepared to um, the way industry do interviews. And uh, uh, I want to be very clear on this point because I think it's crucial. Uh, there are no excuses not to be prepared. Today, we have a lot of access to a lot of information, tons of information you have at disposal and uh, PhDs, young PhDs have to be ready to this process. So I wanted to give you some uh, maybe advices from my point of view of what are the do's and don'ts in the recruitment process that can help you uh, overcome some of the difficulties of this process because it's really, it's a nine inning boxing match, uh, um, uh, uh, an interview with the, with the company. So uh, for the do, definitely do your homework. What that means, if you're interested uh, in a position, don't just send your application, research the company, um, try to understand why they have the vacancy open. Is this a new position, for example, or somebody left, or maybe they're trying to build a new facility or a new department inside the company. Understand who is the hiring manager and who is involved in the recruitment process. Again, here, no excuses. Uh, you're living in a social media era, so you have to leverage social media wisely to get an edge on your perspective to work for the company. About the don'ts, I just said that don't simply send your application. Uh, that would be some kind of waste of time. You have the same chance to be chosen as you have the same chance of winning the lottery if you just send an application. Mm -hmm. uh, you will be put together with a whole lot of competition and or worst, your CV will be screened by a, an ATS, which is an applicant tracking system, a, a computer to put it bluntly. So uh, you don't want that. What do you really want is to stand out from the crowd. So in order to do that, another do is do get in contact with people. Try to connect, try to engage with them, try to get as many informations as you can. Uh, one thing you don't want to do on the contrary is just to forward your CV to these people. Uh, because that would be really uh, gross, I say. Uh, what you want to do is to show them you're curious. So just engage with the people and say, hello, my name is Carlo, for example, and I saw you posted this position for uh, this new position and would be keen to know more. So try to engage with the conversation. Uh, and here I come to probably what I think is the most important do of all, do make questions. Because if you're lucky enough to get, to get to the interview with a company, at some point, you will get to the point where you're asked, uh, do you have any question for me? And now I can tell you very, very easily that if you say, no, I'm, I'm just fine. I got everything. Uh, I got all the information I need. Well, that candidate very hardly, very hardly would be hired. That's guaranteed. So that's the, the, the moment where you want to make questions. Uh, make open questions, uh, questions that the answer is not strictly yes or no, but they are open. Uh, so you show interest. Uh, for example, uh, you can ask uh, what is 
the thing that you like it most about working for that company? Or uh, what is the biggest challenge that your company is facing and how the new hire uh, can help overcome this challenge? Or how will be my job uh, evaluated so that I can have a positive impact on the organization? This is your chance to get more information, to get an edge and to show curiosity and to show that you're really a good fit for that job. So don't waste it. So uh, finally, my take home message will be uh, do what you can do best. Be creative, uh, get notice. And the best thing to do that is to make practice. Start early, start now, even during your PhD to make your connection and rehearse, repeat how to manage an interview and I, I cannot assure that, but I'm pretty sure that the right opportunity will come up. Thank you. Great. Uh, for, thank you for such a brilliant presentation. You know, Alpha Sigma is one of the top five pharmaceut pharmaceutical companies in Italy. So are you recruiting PhD? Aren't you? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, my question. We, <laughs> yes, uh, the PhDs point. are required more and more for a number of roles, which is not restricted to research and development, of course. Of course, research and development is where there is the higher concentration of PhDs, but uh, things are getting bigger for PhDs also in other uh, company functions, like, for example, um, regulatory affairs. So the, the, the function inside the company where uh, uh, our people interact with the regulatory agencies, which are those agencies that actually granted uh, the permission to uh, market a, a drug. Um, also, a patent, uh, the, the, the legal and the patent aspect are very, very hungry of PhDs because they have that knowledge, uh, technical knowledge, and they can really understand uh, technical matters from a, a very, uh, a very inside out point of view. So, um, yes, technically, there is no limit to PhDs to where they can work inside a company. Uh, and I'd really say that it's up to you to, to, to state your value and to make sure that this value is appreciated and regarded as, a, uh, as an added value to the company. There is a question sir, for you. What types of information is, is essential to be reflected into a cover letter about the company out of our research while applying for a job? Well, um, uh, <laughs> I think cover letter can be a matter of debate. Uh, I'm not an expert in HR, so I, I just give you my take. Uh, cover, letter, cover letter is not always necessary. Uh, sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. Uh, sometimes I prefer cover letters. Uh, if uh, I don't think there is a specific matter that you have to, uh, to cover on the cover letter. Uh, what I always like to, to see uh, in a CV or in a cover letter or wherever any application is something that interests is intriguing me, is interesting me. So try to try to tell a story, try to say something that is intriguing. Uh, of course, you want to say who you are uh, and why you apply for that position. And uh, of course, uh, why you're interested in that position and what makes you special for that position. This is something that really uh, can be of interest for who is reading. Always remember that people who are reading are uh, sometimes they have a very small span of attention. Mm -hmm. So try to, to be catchy. To, to be short and concise instead of too long. And maybe, you know, like, uh, like Giacomo Leopardi, what is uh, vague and not so definite, sometimes is even better than too lengthy and too, and too detailed. So great. And uh, I think that it, is, it goes without saying that, is there an evolution, like a career evolution for PhD within your organization? So are there opportunities to grow well, uh, definitely, yes. Uh, of course, uh, opportunities are always a matter of um, uh, uh, luck from one side because you have to be at the right moment in the right place. Uh, but of course, also personal, uh, uh, personal effort. So uh, what I think a PhD can give uh, in terms of difference is the, their effort and their ability to see things from a different perspective. And this is something that is always highly regarded. So as long as you put yourself, put your mind into it and, uh, and do your job every day with, uh, with uh, you know, with constance and, uh, and uh, with uh, uh, perseverance, uh, I think everywhere there's, there's room for improvement. Uh, I started as a scientist. Uh, I moved to the industry as a scientist. 
And then after several years, I've got the opportunity to move to the management uh, and manage research pro projects. But again, it was a, a, a matter of luck because a, a colleague of mine oh, go, went uh, retired. So, I, and I was there and I had a big knowledge of the project, but also you can be, uh, you can be even more, uh, more lucky and, uh, and have other opportunities. So it's pretty much up to you, but don't be too, uh, how can I say, uh, don't be too sad if that don't happen because sometimes it's not up to you. Uh, <laughs> business is very complicated and sometimes yes. you do your best, but it's, uh, it's just not, it's just not your, the opportunity. The right opportunity is given by, by your preparation and the fact that you're in the right spot at the right moment. So not every, everything is under your control and you have to, tell you to, to, you have to just accept it and um, you know, uh, do things good and good things will come. Yes, I agree with you. I totally agree with you. There are lots of questions in the chat, but I think that first of all, we, we, we need to, 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 to to, to, to listen to the presentation of the other panelists, uh, and then we we can so uh, leave the floor to our uh, to the audience. Roxanne Brachet uh, for being here, so from, from the French side, PhD in public health and epidemiology research and platform department at Genopole BioCluster. So, you know, we want to know something more about your background, your current position, if you hire a PhD, um, about your recruitment process, and a final key message. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to present Genopol and our um, funding schemes to, to young researchers. Um, can I share, uh, if I try to share my screen here, yeah, is it? Uh, partage just one second. Juice. Ah, yes. Uh, and if I put it as full screen, is it okay? Yeah, it's full screen. Yeah, okay. So, yes. So uh, I'm uh, Roxanne. I'm a um, manager of uh, partnerships and fundings in Genopol. Uh, more specifically, I'm in charge of academic partnerships and academic fundings that cover fundings to uh, senior researchers uh, as team leaders, uh, fundings to young researchers through uh, postdoctoral fellowships. And we also have other funding schemes to students for uh, internships, for uh, trainings uh, and other, um, um, other operation. Um, and uh, so a few words about Genopol. We are a biocluster dedicated to biotechnologies, uh, genomics, uh, and life science applied to health or to environment. We are uh, located uh, in the Paris region, just um, at uh, 30 kilometers from Paris region. It's the, um, as we say, uh, la, la banlieue parisienne. So. Uh, uh, very easy to 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 travel to to Genopol, and uh, in concrete words, um, we units uh, higher educational uh, institutions, a university, and three engineer schools. And uh, about uh, you have the figure here: um, academic laboratories, um, nineteen academic laboratories. 77 uh, business uh, companies. Uh, companies and laboratories are all in the fields of life science, as I said, uh, in health or in uh, environment. And uh, so in this environment, you have academia, private sector, and we have also technological um, facilities or platforms that are accessible for all uh, the researchers, whatever they are from the academia or from the private sectors. And here you have the distribution of the um, number of people uh, on the different disciplines or research fields and innovation in Genopole. You have here a third of the people uh, who are working in uh, gen and cell uh, biotherapies and around 30% in uh, genomics and um, human genomics and environmental genomics or biodiversity, 
And we have also an important uh, laboratory in uh, bioinformatics and biomathematics. So all, all the research fields that can be applied to health or to environment uh, are um, covered or most of uh, these uh, fields are covered in, uh, in Genopol. So it represents a huge uh, research area in which we can host uh, PhDs uh, just after or, um, their PhD or who are more uh, senior in their, uh, uh, in, in their uh, cursus. Um, you can find more details in the annual report. And in terms of support to the researchers and to the PhD, we have several programs. As I said, we have a program for uh, team leaders, a program uh, for uh, postdoctoral mobility. Uh, we also support the creation of uh, companies. Uh, and as I said, also, we support the, the training and mentoring program, for example, for researchers who want to open to uh, entrepreneurship uh, and are interested in creation of uh, private companies. So here uh, I will focus on uh, point two and three, which are, I guess, more interesting for uh, PhDs. Um, and yeah, we have launched uh, last year uh, with the partnerships with uh, ABG, um, uh, a program which is called Apogee Bio. It is a program to fund postdoctoral fellowships. It's co-funded by the European Commission. So, you know, it's uh, within the field of um, uh, the category of uh, programs, uh, um, Marie Curie, Marie Sklodowska Curie uh, co-fund. So um, we will open the next call, the second call of Apogee Bio this week. And the deadline will be on 30 of January. And the aim of this uh, fellowship is to attract uh, researchers from all over the world, from Europe or from uh, outside of Europe and <laughs> from Italy, uh, who, wants to, who wants to make, to perform a postdoctoral postdoctorate either in an academic laboratory or in a private company. This is also possible. The hosting of uh, uh, postdoctoral is possible in both uh, sectors within Genopol. Uh, it's uh, um, a funding uh, that corresponds to an average of 3,000 euros uh, per month as a net salary and for a total duration of 24 months. It's uh, the usual duration of a postdoc. Uh, so in the, on the, uh, the website, you, you can find more details on the hosting teams, as I said, academic or private hosting teams, and you can get more details. I just show you just 30 seconds, the, the website. Does it work? Does it work? Is it okay? Yes. So you can. Uh, no, we, yeah. we, we cannot see the, the website. Well, you cannot see the presentation. Okay. So I come back to the presentation then. Uh, oh. um, mm, mm, mm. Nouveau partage. <laughs> I should have not clicked on the website. Arrêtez le partage. I stop it and I come back to it. Is it okay? Yeah, we see the, the presentation. The presentation, okay. So uh, you will find uh, more uh, information on the website, but just keep in mind that it is 24 months, 3,000 euros net per month, uh, hosting in academia or in private uh, sector, and uh, there are very uh, specific conditions and eligibility criteria that are from the European Commission. We cannot change them. So uh, take the time to read carefully the, the information uh, th th that you will find on the website. For example, there is a mobility rule. It is strictly for uh, incoming mobility. So if you are already living in France for more than uh, two, or, uh, two or three years, then you, you will not be eligible, for example. 
So take uh, take the time to really be aware about uh, all the conditions and the criteria. And another uh, obligation from the European Commission in the Marie Curie uh, actions is that it's up to you as an applicant to make the first proposition of, of uh, research. It is not what we see usually where it's the laboratory or the company who publishes um, a project. Then take the time to, to read carefully the description of the hosting teams that are available on the, on the website and to, yeah, to draft a first proposition that fits to the hosting teams and of course uh, that, that fit also to your uh, expectations. Um, and, um, yeah, so yes, I, I let you the time uh, after uh, afterwards to, to vi visit the, the website. Uh, we have other um, schemes to, to support the creation or, and the development of uh, private companies. Um, maybe I will start, yeah, I will start with this one, the shaker. Uh, you all see it, it's the, the shaker from the ID to the project. It's um, a program in which we support young researchers uh, from the PhD and after the PhD who have uh, an innovative ID uh, and you want to, to test to make the proof of concept. So you apply to this program and once again, you will have all the details in the website of Genopol. You apply to this program with your uh, clear description of the ID, the outcome that you anticipate, uh, the impact that you anticipate. And uh, if you are selected to this uh, scheme, to this uh, call, then you are selected for a duration of six months. During these six months, you have uh, free access. Uh, you are hosted in, uh, within Genopol facilities and you have access to laboratories with all the equipment that are necessary for research. And you have also access to the technological platform, technological facilities. So they include small, but also large equipment that might be useful or, uh, or uh, necessary to your research. For example, uh, imaging, uh, uh, spectro, uh, photometer, uh, flow cytometry. We have all these uh, technological up-to-date and uh, cutting edge uh, equipments that are accessible to the uh, people who are who, who win uh, in, uh, in this call. And all this for free during six months. Then after the six months, if you have made the proof of concept, then you can apply to uh, another program, which is the creation of, uh, of a company. And Genopol uh, uh, accompanies you and uh, yes, support uh, uh, the, the second step of uh, innovation. And if you, oh no, <laughs> for uh, young companies that are already existing or that are coming from the Shaker program, we have the program uh, GenIO, which is a one-year um, uh, support to um, existing, already existing young company. And in this uh, program, then we help you in, uh, for example, uh, to how to, to study and to, to understand the uh, market access, how to make a fundraising, uh, how to enhance the communication of your uh, new company. So it is also a program of uh, coaching and uh, support to, to very young companies. And then after that, we have other programs for more mature companies. But yeah, I think uh, the, more, the, the, the most interesting to you are already in these uh, programs. Um, and yeah. And uh, that's all. <laughs> you, you are really offering many opportunities. So Jean Paul yes. and BioCluster is really yeah, we try to, attractive opportunities. Yeah. To be and we try to attract both in the academic sector and in the private sector. And uh, the aim is to 
not to have academia and private uh, separately, but uh, to create uh, interaction and collaboration. To bridge the gap. To bridge yeah. the gap. This is yeah. this is also the the, uh, the aim. Our the goal of this uh, this panel discussion. So try to bridge the gap between companies and academia. Exactly. So uh, there are lots of questions in the chat, but now I'm going to to introduce uh, the next um, speaker, and I'm just in brackets. Uh, Carlo Barbera is already answer replying to some question in the chat so uh, because we, we we have to we, we we cannot run out of the time there, are, there is another round table later uh, and so thank you thank you so much uh, you, if you kindly you can kindly also reply to question in the chat you can read the chat okay. and uh, i'm going to leave the floor to simone olgiati this, this is the time of, of italy PhD in Human Genetics, Head of Innovative Sequencing Technology Lab, Merck, Italy, so a big American multinational pharmaceutical company. And uh, he, he started uh, after his PhD when we, we met before pre while preparing this round table. I, I, remind, I remember that he, he explained to me that he decided to to stop working for we had a permanent position to do a PhD. So thank you for talking, telling, telling our story. And thank you, Simone. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for the possibility to share my experience with uh, such a young uh, audience. I'm, I'm not an HR professional, I'm a, I'm a scientist. So what I can share today is a bit of my personal experience and also explain uh, what our PhD is doing uh, within uh, Merck. I am a biologist by training. I have studied uh, my master in Italy and uh, I have then spent uh, seven years uh, in the Netherlands uh, studying, uh, uh, completing my PhD in human genetics and performing some uh, uh, initial uh, job activities in startup companies. I have then four years ago moved back to Italy for the position in which I am now. I am uh, uh, responsible for a laboratory in Merck. This laboratory is called Innovative Sequencing Technologies lab. Uh, it's focused on the application of uh, um, recent uh, highly parallelized technologies for the sequencing of nucleic acids, and in particular in the use of these technologies for uh, the development of analytical methods that are used uh, in the biomanufacturing process. I am part uh, of the uh, Merck uh, division that works uh, on, uh, on pharma. It's called healthcare. We are talking about the Merck group that is based in Darmstadt in, the, in Germany. And uh, my team is uh, made up of uh, five people. So I'm responsible for all the daily activities uh, and projects that are carried out uh, uh, in my lab. So I guess one of the things that is of interest for the audience is uh, uh, how I managed to, to land into this position. So I'm going to provide a couple of uh, suggestions that are based on my uh, personal experience. Uh, the first suggestion I'm going to give to the audience is that uh, if you are doing a PhD and you want to move to the academia, you should definitely try to start planning this move early. And by early, I don't mean that two or three months before your PhD defense, you start to look for uh, job positions. This is too late. You need to uh, start in the early years of your PhD, or maybe even before you start your PhD, to really look into the market, uh, understand what are the needs of the market, look for job uh, positions, uh, understand what companies are typically looking for, understand what you have of the skills they look for, and what are your gaps. And the important thing is to really work on those gaps. You need to work hard to fill those gaps. So for example, in my case, I realized early in my PhD that if I wanted to have a future in industry, one of the things that was asked to um, geneticists was also to have some level of uh, data analysis skills. So I've invested a lot into understanding bioinformatics, uh, doing courses, uh, uh, reading books, uh, try to do as much as possible in that space. This is just a technical example, but in fact, uh, as it was also said before, you need to also work a lot on your soft skills. Uh, for example, work on your uh, people management skills. This is typically not difficult in all the uh, laboratories you have 
have the possibility to, for example, follow younger researchers and uh, um, really uh, help them uh, and organize their daily activity. So this is something that typically PhD students uh, develop. Or uh, if you realize you have issues with uh, uh, foreign languages, you should definitely try to do an experience uh, abroad uh, or maybe take courses on technologies in order to expand your horizon. One of the issues I think that the PhDs often have is that they have uh, a very narrow uh, field of research. Uh, they tend to focus a lot uh, on a very narrow field. And if they are lucky enough uh, and that field is of interest for industry, then they are set. They will move easily to, to the industry. But if that uh, uh, narrow field, as it is most of the time, is, uh, doesn't have a business case around it, uh, they will have difficulties. So it's important that you work on all the other skills that uh, PhD students for sure have and that were already mm -hmm. listed early. Um, the second tip I have is that you need to get out of your comfort zone. Uh, it's very important in uh, very uh, early stages of your career to do not settle on the things that you have just because uh, um, starting new activities uh, is scaring you or it requires too much challenge. It's very important that uh, you have the courage to, to start something new. And uh, in my case, uh, Lucia was already mentioning it, uh, even before my PhD, I, I really at some point decided to, to leave a permanent position and embark on the PhD. Uh, that was because uh, at that time, uh, um, I felt like I needed to improve my English skills. I wanted to do a bit more research and I felt like I needed the international experience to enter into, uh, into the research environment. And it was not difficult because it was a couple of years after 2009, so the crisis was still uh, closed and the permanent position in Italy was not easy to come by, but uh, still uh, it was uh, probably the best uh, decision I've taken in, uh, in my career. So I really invite you to do the same. So what are uh, PhD doing in, uh, in Merck? Uh, we recruit PhDs, uh, of course, typically for their technical expertise. Most of the time they start with some type of uh, scientific role. So they enter as a scientist or uh, uh, anyway in technical areas. But what we are really looking for are all the other skills that were already mentioned. So I'm echoing a bit uh, uh, Professor or uh, Dr. Barbera. Um, so they, their uh, communication skills, their people management skills, uh, they typically manage to deliver projects. So they have good time management uh, skills and they also can uh, um, deliver milestones on project. And they're also fast learners and uh, have very good uh, problem solving skills. So these are all things that are very difficult to find in the job market. And um, uh, that's the one of the reasons why we hire them. Um, typically, PhDs only starts from the technical area. In Merck, we have a very structured project um, program for uh, personal development personal development that uh, doesn't only include uh, PhDs. Uh, every employee has a personal development plan that discusses uh, uh, regularly with uh, his or her manager. And uh, based on the personal attitudes, uh, uh, together they define uh, learning uh, activities in order to uh, improve uh, their position and prepare for the next step of, uh, of their career. And uh, the same goes for PhDs. Uh, they have uh, to follow this type of program and typically they will end up in uh, all kinds of positions, uh, quality assurance, uh, regulatory, uh, as well as um, security uh, and environment uh, or uh, in the management of uh, equipment validation and maintenance. So really um, the sky is the limit in this sense. And with this, maybe I would like to also conclude with, uh, um, with my final remark. So I, I think, uh, as I was saying, you, of course, need to start planning on your development early. But in fact, uh, you always have to work on your development. It's a, it's a never-ending process that you will have to continue throughout your uh, entire career. So the, the main message I would like to leave you with is that you have to challenge yourself every time. As soon as you identify a new area that can be 
uh, useful to be added in your CV, but it's something a little bit far from you and makes you uncomfortable, probably is the right decision to go there and really try to tackle that problem. Totally agree. Thank you for, for all this piece of, piece of advice. Uh, just a burning question from my side. Uh, it will be very concise. Pros and cons of working at such a big company like Merck. But the pros uh, for sure is that uh, you have uh, all the possibilities to perform advanced research. Uh, so there's typically no budget issue if you are able to demonstrate that uh, the technology that you want to use uh, is relevant for a business case. Uh, there is typically no problem in investing into it. Uh, so this is, of course, really rewarding for uh, researchers, especially in their uh, early stages. Uh, the cons is, of course, is the same, that uh, every time you propose something, it has to be business uh, related. <laughs> Yes, so um, once again, you, you, I'm, I'm just reminding to the audience, they can keep on writing so questions in, uh, in the chat while we are um, completing our presentation. So once again, thank you to Simone Olgiati, and uh, I'm thank now in, introduce Christelle Blondin, Head of Recruitment and Youth Employment Policy, Stellantis, uh, France, but there is also Stellantis in Torino <laughs> as well. <laughs> And so um, thank you for uh, Guy, telling us something more about your, uh, your uh, career path, your background, uh, even how we, for which position you are recruiting PhDs uh, and a final key message. Thank you. Okay, thank, thanks a lot. So um, I'm very pleased of course to, to take part to this uh, round table. Uh, and to uh, have the opportunity to speak about the Stantis group and uh, about our commitment uh, for PhD. Uh, so I'm Christelle Blondin, uh, I'm the head of uh, recruitment for France. Uh, I have also in charge uh, youth employment, so it means that every year we receive internships, uh, apprenticeships and VU. Um, and uh, I'm also in charge of uh, schools uh, relation. So I, I felt uh, legitimate uh, today to speak uh, because the Stellantis group uh, was born, I mean, from the merger of uh, XPSA uh, and XFCA, uh, so a French group and an Italian group. Um, so maybe I, I'm going to make just a short presentation uh, of Stellantis. Uh, so Stellantis is born, uh, in fact, last year. Uh, it was in January 2021. So it's a young group, in fact. Um, so in, in the past year, so we really uh, try to work uh, in common culture. Uh, so the group is composed now of uh, 300,000 employees. Uh, so we are, we are a big group uh, in more than 150 nationalities. Um, so the group brings together, in fact, 14 brands. Um, so Peugeot, Citroën, uh, Fiat, Chrysler, Maserati, Jeep, Abarth. Uh, VS, Dodge, Opel, Vauxhall, Lancia, Ram, and free to move So, um, so just to give you general uh, maybe uh, information, so the group has sold uh, 6.5 million so vehicles uh, in the 2021. So uh, we are the fourth uh, world car manufacturer and the second in Europe. So maybe the other point, uh, which is maybe significant now, uh, is that uh, maybe we are probably more international. Um, so of course, uh, PSA and FCA were already, uh, I mean, represented uh, in many countries uh, through their uh, different activities, so manufacturing, uh, retail, and support functions. So maybe, um, and, and just to give maybe a focus on what we, we will need to do now is that um, the projects and strategy uh, that we have to work on, uh, see the, we created um, recently a new entity uh, dedicated to software. And uh, we are really focused on electrical and autonomous, uh, autonomous uh, vehicles. So this uh, new entity uh, will have to work on the vehicles of the 14 brands uh, of the group. And so from a group really oriented on uh, manufacturing, uh, uh, we can see now that we are probably more focused on IT. Uh, 
uh, which uh, gives also, I mean, some uh, perspectives for the PhD students. Um, so I, I wanted maybe just to, to precise that um, the group for first uh, to CIFRE, uh, so it's an uh, industrial uh, convention on training uh, through uh, research, uh, students, uh, the opportunity is sure to, to work on specific uh, projects in many different fields. So we have, uh, in average, uh, in France, uh, 70 cifres. Uh, so they stay three years in the company. And so it means that uh, every year we renew uh, one third, in fact, of the cifre. So we welcome each year uh, 20 to 30 new cifre in the company. And so um, usually, in fact, we ask the directions uh, to make uh, the subject uh, uh, emerge. So in fact, that the topics uh, which uh, so where we work on uh, are uh, the autonomous vehicle, uh, lean tech, uh, city of the future, and full digital. So this is the subject uh, that we, we we work on uh, 2021. So in the coming weeks, uh, we will probably have the new uh, uh, orientations, but it will be. Uh, slightly the same, I think. And so, um, so each year, so we have the, the opportunity to, uh, to have some recruitments for PhD. It's not uh, a lot, but we have some. And um, recently, I mean, uh, we have a job offer uh, called the Research uh, Scientist Artificial Intelligence. And it was specifically in the software direction. That's why I wanted really to, to share with you uh, this new orientation for the group, because uh, this is probably where we will probably have some uh, new recruitments in the coming months. So wh what I wanted maybe to, to give in terms of uh, uh, for, for the PhD students, maybe to invite you to um, usually uh, visit our recruitment sites uh, it's www.stellantis.com um, to be uh, and to go into the part uh, called uh, work with us to have a look because um, as soon as we have a new opportunity, uh, so it's a focus on the recruitment side. And so um, I invite you also to candidate online uh, because this is the, the better way for us to, um, to know uh, that you have some interest. And after you, you go into a, a classic process for recruitment. Uh, where you will be, uh, of course, uh, invite for some interview. Um, so yeah, so it, it was quite difficult for me to to um, to. Um, I didn't have uh, an opportunity right now, but uh, that's why I wanted to uh, invite you to usually have a, have a look on our open site to um, to see if there are some opportunity for you. Um, so um, let's uh, let's have a look. <laughs> Yes, so um, Stellantis is, is a new group, and during our webinar workshops of our trade, where we try to strengthen the soft skills of our PhD, we put the stress on uh, the skills of the future. So artificial intelligence is uh, a field, and it's not an unknown yes, field. Yes, it's one field, it of course. Yes, one field. Floor. Yes, and, and we have um, some subject also on mobility. Uh, so, uh, which is uh, which could be also very interesting, maybe for PhD students. Um, this is really some um, some maybe future um, uh, subjects where we we are very involved. Uh, so, um, so I wanted maybe to give just an idea of the of the of the fields uh, where maybe uh, students can find a PhD can find maybe some opportunities. Yes, and just was the, I just check the chat if there are some new. As a PhD in applied robotics for biology, my goal is to work after my PhD in the research and development sector of a company. What advice do you give, would you give me for that? In terms of um, new, for an application? Yes, yes, I think that it was about recruitment. Uh, I put it also in your private chat. You know, as a PhD in applied robotics for biology, my goal is to work after maybe yeah, technical so, advice is to. Yeah, so the idea is really to, um, I think that um, 
point which is quite important is, of course, the, the curiosity and involvement and commitment in the subject um, to be um, to be. Um, motivation, in a, so yes, motivation. of course, motivation. Uh, so in, in in our company, so we have many people quite um, uh, passionate by, by cars, but it's not only the way, <laughs> of course, to, to join the company. Uh, but um, yes, to be uh, motivated um, to, to see or maybe to show your, your creativity also uh, in the way how you can and the approach that you can have on the subject um, and um, the, the, maybe um, how you can treat them. and. Um, uh, of course, to to have to always have um, in your spec some uh, uh, idea of the um, how the mobility can be, uh, uh, how you can uh, have the approach for the for the future uh, in our uh, in a car manufacturer because uh, this is uh, uh, of course we have some environment uh, aspects that we have to to take into account uh, in the different fields, in fact, of the company. So, so definitely, so Stellantis, so a new reality, a big a new group, is hiring PhD. So he's looking yes. for, he's in search of excellence, he's in search of brains. Maybe uh, just, um, sorry, Lucia, just a few uh, words on the recruitment process, Kristen. Yeah, so the recruitment process is really, uh, uh, so I invite people to, to go in, in, into the recruitment site because this is the, um, the, the better way uh, and to apply, of course, if you uh, see an offer uh, where you could be interested in, uh, just apply online so we are informed and so this is the better way and the first uh, step, of course. And after uh, to um, so we'll give you I mean the opportunity after to 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 um, have some contacts with the hiring managers and to to give into details and the technical aspects maybe of the of the job. Uh, so yes, this is the better way. So thank you for uh, for giving us the detailed information about your new new group and uh, our we are we are to complete our round table uh, i'm going to introduce you simona campolongo this one so we, we have a, a woman a, a young and innovative startup phd in agricultural forest, forest and food sciences President and scientist at her own uh, startup uh, founded by her grape SRL. And uh, uh, she, she is going to found another one, is, if I, I well understood. Thank you for telling us something about your success stories. Thank you so much. Hi. Hi. Thanks to inviting me to uh, talk about my PhD experience. Today, I will be the one that will not explain how to be hired by a company because I, I didn't follow the, this process, but I created, as uh, Lucia said, my own work. Uh, I don't know if you can see the uh, presentation. Yes, 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 we can perfectly okay. see, but not the whole screen. It's a little bit... Could you put, now, you put it on full screen? screen? Okay. Now? Okay. Yes. Uh, I'm Simona Campolongo, and um, after uh, my degree in industrial biotechnology, I took a PhD in agricultural science here in Turin. Uh, and during the PhD, I studied a particular yeast that creates problem in wine. Uh, something that I particularly appreciated during, during my PhD uh, was the possibility to visit other countries and to do uh, foreign experiences because I went uh, in UK for three months during the first year. Uh, then in, I studied in Copenhagen for six months, uh, a, particularly, a particular um, uh, microscopic technique. And then I also flew to Australia for four months uh, uh, in a special uh, working in a um, at the um, AWRI. Uh, um, soon after the PhD, 
uh, I, together with two colleagues of the doctoral uh, school, I founded the first company that is called Grape, uh, which also means in Italian, Gruppo Ricerche Avanzate per l'Enologia, um, a company that for years has provided the research and development uh, services for winery. Uh, in 2018, uh, in 2018, I decided that uh, during my PhD, I did a lot of uh, lab work, uh, actually making plates, 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 and a lot of plates uh, to, to to study this uh, particular yeast. And in 2018, uh, after an ex external request, I decided, I studied actually the, um, the market and I uh, discovered that there was, um, there wasn't any device uh, able to, um, able to, to for, for the wineries to do their uh, their analysis in autonomy, they had to send the samples uh, to the equipment laboratories, and then wait for a results. Uh, so, um, in uh, in 2018, uh, I decided to develop a new product for um, in situ analysis. It, it was innovative, easy. Uh, cheap and economic. Uh, I have got two patents uh, and uh, I founded another company uh, a while with a guy who was in Italy a student during my first year of doctorate and then a friend. The new company is now called By Yourself and sell, uh, let's call uh, uh, this product uh, that we can call self something because they are called self breath and self beer. And they uh, actually are offered to wineries and um, breweries. Uh, now uh, we are trying to follow our objectives through uh, some round of crowdfunding and through fundraising. So I'm not going to to tell you how to be hired from a company, but my suggestion is to not get discouraged during the doctorate because even when it seems that nothing is working and no experiment succeeds, you are actually learning something that you will carry with you for your life. I was very fast because I, I, I've been very fast because I, uh, the, on the agenda is written that we have to finish uh, at uh, 55. No, 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 you, you were very concise as well as the others. So to, to, to show your, um, your career development, how you, you could uh, uh, little by little uh, move, I wouldn't say to other sectors because you, you funded you funded your own company and this is why we invited you uh, to this panel discussion because it is another, uh, an alternative career for so PhD, can be hired for high position because they are highly skilled. And so they're in, in companies as Carlo and the, and, uh, the other colleagues, Simone, Christelle Blanden have explained, uh, they are looking for brains for excellence, but they can also invent their work uh, like you. And you, you did it successfully because you, you, you also took the risk because it is difficult to, uh, to leave academia uh, and to, for the unknown, uh, to to leave uh, such a comfort zone and uh, but uh, but it is uh, the, the idea of uh, the, the the added value of researchers and uh, capable of uh, creating knowledge uh, so i think that we there are, there are maybe, some there are questions maybe there just, are yeah, questions. just last quick question about language but uh, i will address this to all speakers what about language skills that are needed in your companies? Ah, okay. For example, is there French companies should uh, applicants should speak the well French or it, and English would be enough? And also for Italian companies, should be it's uh, <laughs> a good level of Italian or English would be also fine. 
Maybe we start again with the, from Carlo who was the first he yeah. can answer. Uh, well, of course, English is mandatory nowadays. Uh, I have to make two different maybe considerations between the, the, the Italian company and then the affiliates. Uh, for the Italian company, uh, nowadays, Italian is still required because most of your colleagues will be Italian. Uh, your environment will be Italian, so you, you will have a, a deep dive into the Italian language and Italian <laughs> way of living, <laughs> which can be troublesome sometimes. <laughs> so um, yes, uh, uh, it's still maybe one of, of the yes biggest barrier now still, of, I think also in academic for the interna internationalization of uh, uh, enterprises and, and academia is that uh, yes, uh, Italian is still very required uh, at the end. So uh, I'd say that most of the of the of the open position now requires uh, to be uh, proficient with the Italian, unless you're applying for another country because we have subsidiaries also in other countries, uh, and uh, in that case uh, the mother language is always leading. But of course, you need to be proficient in English. Yes, Roxanne, what about languages? Yes, about uh, languages. Uh, in Genopole, all the laboratories and companies host international researchers. So of course, English always work, as I said, <laughs> despite the Brexit. So it's not, um, it's not a issue. However, we used to, we support um, uh, French uh, lessons to the, to the arriving uh, researchers. We have a partnerships with uh, Science Accueil. It's a, it's a member of our access uh, network and they organize uh, uh, courses of uh, French uh, and also they organize uh, cultural uh, visits to, to, help, uh, <laughs> to help people to know more about not only the language, but also the, the culture and uh, uh, the, the way of life uh, à la française. <laughs> So we, we give also this kind of support, not only uh, funding the research, but also supporting uh, the well-being uh, in France and uh, in, uh, in Paris. So yes, it's not, a, it's not a problem at the beginning, but yeah, it's better and it's appreciated if the, the researcher makes the effort to, to learn French. About the language. Yeah. Simone? So in our case, uh, English is of course mandatory. For the Italian sites, uh, in the case of positions where there is uh, an involvement with uh, operational activities uh, local, typically it would mean that you have to interact with a lot of Italians, so Italian is still required. But we do have a lot of also global positions where you are coordinating uh, sites across uh, Europe and beyond. So in that case, uh, only English is necessary. Thank you. Christelle Blande. Yes, so for Stellantis, of course, uh, English is really the language uh, mandatory uh, because we are uh, an international group now. So, uh, so for all people, uh, uh, for the people who are coming in the company, uh, so we really ask the people to be able to speak in English, even if you are uh, hired uh, in France. Um, now, I mean, we have many people from many different nationalities. So. Really English, this English. is a professional, professional language, yes. Speak English or die. <laughs> 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 it, publish or die, and so I changed it. Yeah. And so, a, a last question to Simona, because I uh, there, there, there is a question for her. Pros and cons of being a start, an innovative startup. <laughs> Pros and cons is that you have to face the reality. I mean, that you are a startup, you are an entrepreneur, but not always you... You have your, uh, let's say, monthly salary, the, the one you want at the end of the month. So you have to, this is a cons, of course, but the pro is that you are the head of yourself. I mean, if, if uh, I have, let's say that, let's, let's do an example. I have two kids. If one, one day is sick, I can take okay. it with, with my in, in my laboratory uh, that day without having a lot of problem. There are pros and cons. Uh, 
uh, always we hope to be a large group, uh, to, to become a large group. Uh, let's hope. So you are the CEO, Mate Pros, you are the CEO of your time. Yeah, actually, Somehow. I have, a, I have a many uh, guys in my group, uh, but they usually are uh, doing their thesis or sometimes they are PhD, visiting PhD. So I'm actually the head of uh, many people, but temporary people, let's say, because we, we, we are not strong enough to have a permanent position, except me. Okay, yeah, it's clear that you are young, you are promising, so take your time. So we are the, we are finishing because we have another, we have the last um, round, online round table of today. So thanks a million to all our panelists uh, uh, for their uh, for their precious contribution. So I, I am I'm still receiving uh, via also via my mail. So Questions. I think that you are you have you are able to motivate to motivate and stimulate uh, the, our audience uh, with uh, all your tips and, uh, and your success story because it's also about success story. So thank you and thank you. Bye bye and so let's get started again with the last round table. If I may add yes. only one thing for all the for all the attendants. Uh, don't hesitate to contact us, me or uh, all the panelists on LinkedIn or other social networks. I'm only on LinkedIn and uh, to oh. engage if you have more questions. Thank you. And maybe Wonderful. thank you. Who knows? Maybe Alpha Sigma, Mer, Constellantis, or Jean Paul, or, or even someone. Will be higher. We will be able to hire uh, uh, in in the near future some of our <laughs> PhD freshly graduated PhD. Maybe who knows? It's a question of being the right time, in the right place, the right time. Bye bye. Thank you, Thank you all and goodbye. Bye bye. And we're smoothly going to our next round table discussion with PhD holders working in European companies and institutions. We're just mi missing one. Um... Lisa Di Nuovo, Carol Cravero, Alessandro Di Beratore, and uh, Michael Julot. We're just missing Alessandro, but maybe we can start. We can then... start. We can start. So um, I'm really, really happy, happy and honored to to to, to moderate uh, our roundtables, and uh, uh, let me express my gratitude for our PhD graduates uh, uh, joining us now. Uh, one of, uh, of of the goal of our doctoral school is always to uh, to. Um, uh, keep track to track the career of our PhD holder to 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 see uh, if the PhD represented for them an added value. What are they are doing today? Uh, if uh, if PhD leads uh, so, to to a, a better career, and I, the, the answer is yes, uh, is uh, because we we show demonstrated concretely, and let's. Start with Carol Cravero. Uh, she she is the testimonial also for for Cotutel for uh, Cotutel thesis, so a, a binational uh, uh, PhD thesis. She she got a degree a PhD in sustainable public procurement and. Uh, she, she embarked for an international career after uh, many, many international experience. Uh, this is the key, I would say the key message of, of her speech. And now she's working, she has a position at the World Trade Organization in Geneva. So tell, thank you for telling us something about your, your story, your background, what are you doing now? How could you, could you get this position? And uh, what would you, would you suggest? What would you suggest to our freshly uh, graduated PhD. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Lucia, for uh, inviting me and for this kind of introduction. I will try to tell my story in a couple of words, maybe a little bit more than a couple, because I did a, quite a lot of things in the same time, at the same time. So basically, um, I have a degree in law uh, from the University of Turin in 2012. Uh, then I passed my bar exam in 2015 after two uh, internships 
case, uh, one at a criminal court and the other one uh, in a law firm. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I started uh, some uh, international consultancies for the International Training Center of the International Labor Organization, which is the ITC ILO in Turin. Uh, and basically, it was for a master program in sustainable public procurement, Le Marche Public Durable. Um, so this is uh, this was uh, uh, mainly for uh, African uh, French speaking countries. Uh, and uh, let's say that over over time, uh, during uh, these eight years of, of consultancies, I um, had a kind of feeling. So I felt that there was a, a missing piece of uh, the puzzle of my career, and that missing piece was a PhD. So I decided to start my PhD in 2017, so more or less five years after my degree in law, uh, because I thought that uh, for me to be recognized as an expert in the field, it was a very important step. Uh, I decided to um, uh, have this uh, to enroll in this uh, joint program, uh, University of Turin and University of Paris, Paris 10. And it was uh, really a great experience. Uh, I tried to um, assist uh, and follow many conferences and workshops uh, just to build my own network as it it was also advised uh, in the beginning of this uh, event. Um, and um, over time, I had the opportunity to get a new consultancy for the African Development Bank uh, for the public procurement law reform in Senegal. And after this one, I spent four months in Ouagadougou, the capital city of Burkina Faso, as an individual consultant of the Ministry of Finance and Economy of Burkina Faso to carry out their public procurement law reform in order to incorporate sustainability criteria. And I was also a little bit lucky, let's say, um, as, uh, as someone told before, you sh you have to be uh, at the good, uh, at the right spot, and uh, at the right moment. So I um, I knew I knew uh, that uh, I was selected for this uh, current position at the WTO in December 2021. Uh, so I started this new contract. Uh, I have a, a short-term contract, so less than uh, one year. Uh, I'm working as a legal affairs officer at the World Trade Organization. As you can see from my background, I'm working specifically on government procurement. So this is my field. Um, and we have a treaty on this. So basically my activity is to assist and advise governments, uh, representatives of different governments, parties to our agreement in their negotiation process. And what I really like is the fact that I'm at the heart of the multilateralism where decision should be taken and sometimes are taken. Um, and so governments and representatives have to sit down around the table, discuss, exchange, find a compromise and find an agreement, reach an agreement whenever possible, even on sensitive issues like sustainability. So sorry if I uh, if it was a little bit long, uh, but I wanted to just to uh, share my my story. Um, I don't know if you have uh, more questions for me, uh, Lucia. Yeah. So one question is uh, uh, how what are the skills the skills uh, you acquired during your PhD? You think I think that international the take home home message listen to you is an international experience. Pay, pays off uh, in your case, the PhD and an international experience because you, your PhD was also a co to tell uh, by national. Yeah. So what are the skills you think that helped you to, to, to arrive to get such, a, such an interesting and important position? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a, a very good uh, question. In fact, I have to admit that I have learned a lot from my PhD, for instance, uh, how to take uh, criticism, because as you know, uh, a thesis is not only the result of your own research, but also of others' constructive criticism or uh, comments, feedbacks. So how to handle with these uh, criticism or feedbacks, uh, how to get stronger 
uh, whenever you receive a criticism, uh, how to convey messages in a clear and hopefully concise way, uh, how to stand up for your position. These are uh, important skills that I acquired uh, during my PhD. And um, what about the network? So the network was in person. How would you uh, rate the importance of, of, of the network in your career development? <laughs> It's uh, very important uh, um, because um, in, in the past, uh, what I was used to do was to share my uh, CV with some colleagues uh, and then uh, with my network, uh, because what I think is that uh, opportunities do exist and there are a lot of opportunities across the world, but sometimes we don't know that they exist or on the contrary, recruiters don't know that there is a good fit somewhere in the world. Um, so it's very important to have a network and uh, my network was important especially for my consultancy activities it was really a very important part of my yeah. career uh, there is a chat so what about the recruitment process how how can you apply for, for a position in uh, the world trade organization because it is, is difficult for for extra, for us uh, working in a completely different context to how to to, to yes. arrive there. <laughs> Yes, the, uh, each uh, international organization has uh, its own portal. Um, uh, so you have uh, one for the UN system, one for the WTO. Uh, in this portal, all uh, vacancies are published. So you can uh, have a look at all of them. And uh, if you are interested in some of them, you can apply. So the recruitment, uh, the recruitment process uh, uh, is a little bit complex in the sense that it's a multi-step process. So first, of all, once you are interested in one of them, you have to send your CV through this portal. Um, if you are selected, then after a couple of months, there is a written exam. The written exam is usually based uh, on the position itself, so it's content-based. To give you an example, in my case, it was on sustainable public procurement. If you pass this written exam, then there's a, a, an oral exam after a couple of months again. Uh, the oral exam can be um, made up of different uh, sub-steps. One of them is a short presentation, usually a 10 minutes uh, presentation. You are given the topic the night before or even a couple of hours before the oral exam. So you have little time to get prepared. But I would say that the most challenging part, at least to me was to answer these difficult questions on soft skills. They are usually very interesting in, know, uh, in knowing how you deal with different difficult situations. For instance, you can be asked uh, how uh, you can uh, how you have dealt with uh, a difficult conversation with a colleague, or whenever you receive a bad criticism or a negative criticism, what is your reaction? Well, whenever you receive this kind of question, uh, you don't have to, um, let's say, provide a kind of statement, but you should be able to provide a concrete example, a kind of scenario with a lot of details. Um, so if you, if you are not able to provide a concrete example, because for instance, you have never experienced before this or that situation, you can also uh, be honest and say, well, it never happened to me, but in the case, I would act in this or that way. Uh, the most important thing to know is that there is no one single answer that is okay, that is acceptable. Uh, they just want to know how you can deal with difficult situations. Mm, soft skills. So, so, so you see that uh, the importance of the, to, to train. So you have to be prepared. Uh, yes, indeed. And by the way, uh, there's a, uh, this a website of uh, the UN system, uh, which is called uh, Inspira, I-N-S-P-I-R-A. Uh, and you can find a lot of videos, uh, tutorials and guidelines on how to deal with this difficult uh, selection process. Okay, maybe at the end of your presentation, could you put it in the chat because Perfect. it's very interesting and uh, 
to last very, very quick question. So pros and cons of your position, of your work, because you decided to, to move to, to other contexts, to, to also to, to live abroad. And a, a, a final tip in, in two free words, maximum three words. Yes, uh, I will start with uh, the first question. Um, there's uh, There are a lot of positive aspects uh, in doing this kind of job. Um, even if uh, um, sometimes I miss a little bit the research, so I'm not able to say what the future will bring. Uh, so let's see, I'm just trying to enjoy also this experience as much as I can and learn a lot because we can always improve and always learn from all experiences. Um, in three words, uh, I will say resilience, never give up. Um, in my case, uh, I... I, how can I put it? Uh, I try to apply for different positions and I also received, of course, as everyone does, I received uh, a lot of uh, emails of rejection and this might be frustrating and it was frustrating for me as well, but I try to not to see this as a failure, but more as um, a, an opportunity to rework my CV because basically um, it's not only a matter of who you are, what you can do, but it's also a, a matter of how you explain this. Uh, so um, this is, uh, yes, my key message. Thank you, thank you so much, and thank you for thank writing you. in the chat. Uh, yes, uh, sure. because it will be of great, uh, of great help. And now we have Alessandro Liberatore, huge big thanks for, for another reason because he woke very early, woke up very early. He is now in Pasadena, and it is very early in the morning. So <laughs> we are really grateful. Our gratitude goes to Alessandro for joining us to join. And uh, he, Alessandro, PhD in physics and astrophysics, postdoctoral research fellow at the NAC NASA in Italian with Jet Propulsion Laboratory in the United States, Pasadena. And so tell, thank you for telling us something about your uh, uh, postdoctoral career. But how, how could you get uh, a position as a research fellow in there? What are you doing? What are the perspective uh, and uh, the skills uh, uh, the most required? The, 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 the most required skills for your current position and the final tip. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present myself and my uh, my career, my academic career. And yeah, I'm today. Uh, my academic career starts uh, in Turin with a bachelor degree in physics, and. Just after my PhD, my bachelor degree in physics, I did uh, an internship in um, at KTH in uh, Stockholm, in Sweden. It's still in physics, working on what will be my uh, master thesis, uh, focus on astroparticle physics. Then I start my uh, master degree uh, still in Turin. I come back to Turin. Uh, working on particle physics, where I had the, the chance to perform a new internship. And so you can already start probably uh, to understand a key point, in my opinion, that is the international, that are the international experience. And during the, this new internship, I work in Kosice, Slovakia, the space department, the space physics department. Uh, working on what will be uh, the the field of research of my uh, PhD that is focused on uh, that was focused on the heliophysics, so the interaction between the the sun and uh, the earth in, in my particular case. Uh, indeed, during my PhD, I PhD performed at the National Institute of, Institute of Astrophysics in uh, close to Turin, in Pino Torinese, working at the observatory of Pino Torinese. And there I had the opportunity to uh, develop my skills, skills that were ex extremely necessary for my actual position, that were uh, for sure the 
ability of work with different tools, uh, IT tools, so different programming languages, and also um, deal with uh, different problem. Every day there was a, a different problem to deal with from an experimental point of view and a theoretical point of view. Uh, indeed, uh, peculiarities of my actual position uh, in JPL is that there, there is a very dynamic environment. Every day you do something different, of course, focus on the project you're working on and you must be prepared. So problem solving skills are very fundamental for uh, those are interested in this kind of job. And you also uh, should be prepared to a very, and this is probably, I don't know if it's pros or cons, but um, is ugly competitive environment. Uh, every week you have to demonstrate that um, what you did in the, during the week, but uh, is compared with, strongly compared with what is performed by other stud, stud, uh, students at your same level. And the contracts, there are different contract, uh, contracts in, uh, in JPL, but the most common ones are the one plus one plus one. So every year, uh, both you and uh, and JPL must be on the same line and decide to continue. So um, there is a, yeah an ugly, ugly competitive environment definitely. And as said, uh, making international experience with uh, in several uh, I would say uh, with different people can uh, definitely be useful. For example, um, to apply for GPL, you need three um, reference letters at least. And of course, it's important who uh, can write to you these uh, letters. And during my PhD, during my master's degree and PhD, I had the opportunity, for example, to work with an astronaut uh, and with also um, ESA people. ESA is the European Space Agency. And you have to demonstrate with to these people that you uh, have the possibility to work with that you are good in, at your work. So make your uh, network because it's fundamental. <laughs> and I think that uh, in a nutshell, you could you have just to dare mighty things <laughs> because. Um, Sometimes people say, no, uh, I cannot apply to this position because it's, it's too much for me. It, 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 it doesn't exist. It's never, it, it, nothing is too much for you. You have just to believe in yourself and try. In the worst case, you just um, try an, another one, a new job interview and you, just, you can just develop your skills in job interviews. So try and believe yourself. Uh, maybe, um, how could you um, get this position? I mean, uh, was network I, uh, useful for you? Uh, how could you define this such a... Yeah, I found this position because there was an internal uh, mail at the, uh, at the National Institute of Astrophysics where I performed my PhD, where uh, they asked for um, a, a postdoctoral fellow in, um, in astrophysics at JPL. And then I checked online uh, the details about this, this position, in particular on LinkedIn. And, and then I decided to apply. I, I saw that there was something like already, I don't, I don't know, 10, it seems, uh, person that applied in, in a few. Um, and my network was extremely useful for two main uh, reasons. One is because, uh, as I said before, there was, it was necessary to have some um, letters from, from them. I had to, I had someone, I, I needed someone to, to ask for this letter to, um, that can kind of guarantee for me. And Another important reason is that um, 
in, for my particular case, I had to demonstrate that I can give them something more uh, cooperating with others. For example, they need some data, some experiences that uh, just the Italian group in this case had. And I focus my attention on this, uh, on this pros, because if uh, I could work with JPL, I uh, could help them uh, with some data that otherwise they uh, were take a, a lot of time to uh, be, be analyzed. And that's the, the two main reasons. Of course, uh, there will be also uh, other ones, but for me, there were the, the two main ones. And what about, so two last questions, um, what about the recruitment process? How did it work? Uh, uh, for, for, for if there is someone listening to you now who would like uh, to, 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 yeah. to try? And, and a final key message uh, you could give uh, to young PhD students at the end of their career PhD program and in search of uh, uh, positions. Yeah, there's um, a link online uh, that is called uh, NASA Research uh, Position. And it's not just for JPL that is uh, part of NASA, but there are different uh, uh, centers. And you can saw there all the vacancies, the open vacancies uh, to, to apply. And once you apply, they, you should again send your CV, of course, uh, and uh, the, the recommendation letters. Then there will, there will be a first screening on the prerequisite and then in my case, there were uh, two um, interviews online. Uh, the first one more fo uh, focused on my past, so what I did, my experience. And the second one uh, was more about uh, what I can do for JPL, uh, why me? And this again is about what I said before, so the importance of networking. <laughs> And this was my, in, in my case, the, the process. I'm not sure that if are, is the same for uh, every position, but I think that for a postdoctoral fellow is almost the same. And in a nutshell, I think that uh, my tip could be uh, make international experience. I think that was the, the key feature of my uh, CV that was really relevant for uh, for win this position. Uh, I had have very uh, I have a lot of international experience and experiences, and I think that uh, are the key definitely to uh, be able to uh, win different position, especially outside uh, Italy. I mean, the, your country, <laughs> of course. Yes, yes, and so uh, well, I think that. Uh... <clears throat> it's, uh, it is crystal clear that uh, uh, to arrive to get such a position, you prepared, uh, you, you had a particular survey. Uh, so it, it's a journey, so like a, a self journey that is really PhD and the, the preparation of your career. It's mm -hmm. uh, it's a, a journey, and uh, so our take home message today today was also another one. You can do whatever you want with your PhD uh, if you decide to move uh, uh, to other contexts. For you, it's research, but not not in academic real so academic context. Thank you, Alexa Alessandro. Maybe thank you if you can reply to our question in in the chat. You can you can if you can reply. Thank you so much, and. Uh, uh, now uh, we, we have Elisa Di Nuovo, PhD, oh, this just in brackets, I, 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 we decided to invite also a representative, a testimonial for humanities. If PhD is poorly understood uh, or regarded in, uh, outside the uh, academia in Italy, for humanities, it's even more difficult to, to, to demonstrate that PhD is an added value, and even to, 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 to build, even to build a, a, 
a professional profile, it's really difficult, but Teresa Di Nuovo is, is a, 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 the example of a success story because with her PhD in digital humanities, so an interdisciplinary uh, PhD, innovation language professional, she is now an innovation, she's working at the European Parliament, so an international career again, innovation language professional, speech to text. Um, at, the, at the European Parliament, and so thank you for, for uh, telling us something more about your background. How could you get such an interest, interesting position? What are you do concretely doing at the European Parliament with the, your uh, uh, background? Uh, was your PhD a, a, a precondition or an asset? asset and what, what advice would you give to uh, your colleague, your young colleagues. Okay. Thank you, Lucia, for your kind introduction. So, as you said, I'm working at the European Parliament in Luxembourg. Right now, I'm in Turin instead, because just yesterday I defended my PhD thesis that was uh, in uh, digital humanities. And uh, yeah, usually, PhDs, uh, if you have a PhD in something related to humanities, it's very hard to find a position in uh, industry or in institutions. But I have to say I was in the right place at the right time because uh, to, to get this position, I just replied to an email that was sent to my to, to my research group here in Turin. They were looking for a computational linguist. And uh, then I had two interviews. I had, of course, to send a CV. And then after two interviews and uh, maybe two months to hand in all the documentations that they need to verify if you can actually be uh, the person they are looking for, then uh, I was there. And I was there after I, the day after I finished my scholarship. Um, they waited for me because they were looking for someone just before. And um, they were so happy to have me because I'm not, as you said, it's, uh, it was my study was an interdisciplinary one. So I joined my passion for linguistics with what it is very popular nowadays, that is computer science. So my PhD was in between computer science and uh, linguistics and foreign languages. So I had to learn a lot by myself because usually, at least in my PhD, there is no one there uh, teaching you what to do and you have to uh, find courses that can be helpful for you but it was very highly rewarding because now I'm in Luxembourg I, I am in charge of the evaluation of a tool uh, this tool is able to perform in real time speech machine translation this means that it is used uh, uh, for accessibility reasons and uh, it allows people who are deaf on, or hard of hearing to follow in real time plenary sessions that usually happens in Strasbourg. And thanks to this tool, they can read the translation into their native language because the tool currently uh, works with the 19 languages, but at the end of the next year, it will cover all the 24 official languages of the European Union. I don't know if I answered all your questions. Yes, so I have one, so one question. So I, when we decided to invite Elisa, we found her, her position, her, professional profile very interesting because uh, you think European Parliament, maybe you, you, you we, I, I was thinking about translation, translator, on the contrary, uh, she uh, she's 
she's also a technician somehow for what she is doing. And it, so she is a demonstrator, she, she can demonstrate, or PhD can demonstrate uh, uh, the employability for, for humanities <laughs> as well. In, in, in any way, if you are highly skilled, uh, you, you, you can get this kind of. Wow. Nowadays, you can have the same skills doing a master's degree, a master's degree, because uh, in Italy, uh, nowadays, some universities offer courses that are in computational linguistics, which is the subject that I studied during my PhD. And nowadays, a lot of companies hire computational linguists. So if you are, a, if you are passionate of linguistics, then if you add the computational side, then for sure it's easier to find a job. Yes, my, our, our alumni, our PhD graduates might also help us to better explore job opportunities outside academia. So um, digital humanities is an in, interdisciplinary PhD uh, combat where, where linguistics, linguistics is combined with uh, uh, computer science, and that's how you could easily found uh, with such high uh, skills uh, your um, disposition. Uh, and but it was you, you were asked uh, for, for this position was the PhD a prerequisite requisite or were you uh, or, or was it an asset? No, it was an asset. Actually, an asset. my position, the prerequisite is just a bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. But in Italy, there are not bachelor degrees in computational linguistics. There are some masters that are starting like this year in uh, Pisa, I guess, or maybe in Padua, there is so also something, but not in all the cities in uh, Italy. And uh, I knew that in other countries, like in Spain, they had these courses just uh, already five years ago. So what they needed was a computational linguist because it was necessary to have the knowledge of artificial intelligence and deep learning in order to be able to understand what mm -hmm. we can uh, achieve with these tools, what we can ask to the external company who is developing this tool. Um, yeah, and also to run some com compute some metrics in order to automatically uh, evaluate this tool. But of course, since we are at the European Parliament, we don't we don't only we, we don't use only automatic metrics but also uh, human evaluation, because we work with our translators in order to evaluate, evaluate and have uh, confirmation from translators about the quality. Just reading uh, commentary, this is a real example of, a, of a opportunity creation, opportunity use, so exciting example like it. Uh, your final key message, your, your final tip, a tip, a tip what, what advice, what kind of advice would you give to uh, your colleagues, your young colleagues, and uh, um, tips for early career researchers planning an international mobility? Mm, about the second question, really, I don't know, but for the first one, I can say that if you want to work, for example, at the European Parliament and uh, you are not lucky enough like me to receive just a mail and they are looking for you, right, you, then you can apply for an internship because uh, each year there are two rounds of uh, internships in the European Parliament. It is called Schumann Traineeship Program and uh, you can... Um, uh, you can uh, work there for five months and if you are good usually uh, you can find a place there so the majority of my colleagues uh, have started uh, being trainees and now they have contracts and um, but this is good news this is good yeah. news so there is hope there is hope for so permanent position for for humanities uh, or and for research uh, at the European Parliament, there is uh, an, institution, an institutional 
directorate called uh, EPRS, who deals with research because um, of maybe course- Maybe could you, could you put it in the chat, Elisa? Yes, sure. Because maybe people can take notes. And so, and thank you, it is very interesting, but we have another, uh, the, our last speaker. So, and you know, we have uh, uh, to, not to run, we don't have to run out of time. So thank you so much, Elisa, if you can write in the chat so people can take notes. And so Michael, I'm just leaving the floor to Michael Julot, PhD doctor in materials engineering, global account manager at Automotive Europe. So another field, a completely different field. And so, but very interesting as well. So thank you so much for telling something more about your background, your current position, if your PhD was an asset or a prerequisite, what are the skills the most in demand in your field? And if you are hiring, what are the position offered to PhD? And your final tip, both your final so key message, uh, general key message and what are, um, okay, thank you. Good evening, can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. okay, good. So good evening, everybody. Thanks a lot um, for the invitation and the opportunity in, in to, to talk about my experience. And I remember some 18 years ago when I was a PhD, for sure, I would have appreciated this kind of a, of, um, of a conference. So yes, a uh, long time ago, I had a PhD in material science in Grenoble area, so very close to the apps. Uh, in microelectronics. Uh, then I started a little bit working still in microelectronics, uh, having, uh, I would say, the usual way of move to professional life from a PhD, uh, which is I started to work on my PhD topic. So directly involved as a project manager for to develop my project uh, with a specific tool supplier. Uh, and then I started to move to a completely different world, moving to Italy and moving to uh, to automotive world, uh, starting to work as a quality manager, um, European quality manager, then moved to uh, the dark side of uh, the moon and moving to commercial position, uh, being an affiliate uh, Italian territory manager. And then uh, now I was a global account manager because I just left my position and decided to go back to my previous passion, which is innovation and go back to uh, to support people to, to work in innovation. So fresh and new from a few days ago. Um, so for sure, I had the two cases in my professional life. The one that is very unusual that I had the opportunity to work directly in the field where I was an expert, which is really, to be honest, uh, everybody have to be realistic. It's a very, very narrow chance after your PhD to find something that is exactly fitting what is your expertise. So probably you will not work in your expertise. You will work in something else and you have a lot of talents to do that. And, and you are prepared to do that. You are not. Probably you are not aware of that, but you are ready to do that. Uh, and then I moved to something that is, was completely different. But nevertheless, using what, what I learned and why, what I developed during my PhD, um, all of all PhD, who some are a little bit more lucky, some are a little bit less, but you will face some troubles, unexpected troubles. You will solve them, you will find a solution. So you will show that you are able, you are, you are developing your problem solving capacities. You have, you are the leader of your own thesis, so of your own PhD. So it means that you are able to show also your leading capacities. Uh, so at the end, this is what what was appreciated, I would say, in my job and when I applied to the job, the aspect I wanted to show to everybody is that indeed a PhD, it's it's a professional experience where you where you are somehow you have a small company, your own company, yourself. 
and you do everything in your company. You manage your time schedule, you manage your program, you manage your budget, you manage your contacts, you manage your network, you manage everything. You manage your marketing, how you sell yourself, how you sell your project. So it's just a matter of, uh, indeed, if I can give a very, very important message to all of you is work on yourself. Try really to 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 see in yourself what you learned, what you developed. You developed a lot of things, so don't limit yourself. Be proud of yourself and uh, and and go for it. Network is key. Network is for me. I think it's one of the most important uh, tool, more than than a bottle uh, for. Uh, for people's selection more than everything. It's, it allow you, and we heard it many times before, to be in the right place at the right time. Because if you are not there, for sure you will not be selected. Maybe some very often you will not be selected, but if you are not at the right place, you will not be selected. Yes, yes. Thank, thank you so much for your presentation and the, the, your piece of advice. I think that it is true. Uh, network counts. Uh, maybe more than eighty percent. It counts really a lot when uh, when you're building your career, when you're preparing your career, and even during your your career. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it's it, they have to work on the. To how to network, but how, how to build a valuable network and how, how to nourish it, how to maintain it, because it is not so easy and you, you, you don't yeah. have to, uh, to take it for granted. It's, it's, it's like a journey, like a journey. it's something in progress, but it, it pays off uh, in a uh, little bit. So uh, there is a final question for our panelists. The same way we start again with, with Carol. Tips for early career researchers planning an international mobility. Yes, that's a very good also. Sorry. That's a good question. I would suggest uh, identifying, uh, first of all, uh, research groups in your field you would like to work with uh, and uh, try to list uh, all of them and uh, try also to get in touch uh, with professors or uh, researchers uh, working already in this context. And you can get in touch with them and try to ask questions, uh, first of all, so that you can know uh, a little bit uh, their work uh, and uh, even uh, what are the main rules when applying for an international mobility. So this is my piece of advice. Okay, thank you. And now Alessandro. Ah, we, we cannot hear you. We cannot hear you, Alessandro. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I was uh, yes, I just replied, but uh, in the particular case that you're interested to move in um, in the USA, that is my case, uh, I suggest you to uh, look in details about the different visas because there are very strictly uh, rules and you risk to be uh, kicked out from the country if you don't respect them. And sometimes uh, are not easy at all. For example, uh, the, with the common visa that you have, you cannot apply for uh, a green card or something like that. Otherwise, uh, you cannot work anymore on, on, in the USA. And for sure, you could contact the relocation office uh, of your agency. Um, it's pretty common to have one here that will help you uh, under different tax space, for example, taxes or uh, other uh, realities. And moving in a totally different country, such as USA, so uh, very far from your, your home, I suggest you to move several weeks before, before the starting oh, yes. day. <laughs> yeah, to right. prepare. Yeah, you, you, you have to prepare yourself uh, to the society, not only the work. Be prepared and then keep on. And then you can, you can focus on your work. Yeah. 
Yes, otherwise you are not you are, you are not uh, ready to work to start to research yeah. do research. It's... Yeah, of course. Elisa, oh, they already said two very important tips. What I can stress maybe is that maybe it's easier to go in a research group in which someone in your current research group or past research group, you know, someone there. So. Um, maybe you could ask to uh, your own network if they know someone in a specific research group in another uh, place that you would like to go. So maybe this could make it easier. Thank you. And Michael? Yes, uh, maybe two things. Uh, probably be, I'm, I would say, if you are interested for international experience, uh, there is a lot of opportunities nowadays with uh, with Horizon 2020 and things like this. So, I mean, you can take the leadership on this. You can be the one who promote this and, and have uh, the opportunity maybe to start with, um, I would say, maybe a, an international project that, uh, that, you, can, that you can push. Uh, this is something that for sure have to be evaluated and do not expect, uh, I would say, that your laboratory director know everything about potential opportunities of uh, collaboration. And secondly, one thing once you are, because I already experienced to move to two different countries, once you move, uh, be patient. You will have up and down. So I uh, usually at the beginning, everything is great. Then after a while, everything is not as expected. So be patient. Uh, you, need, you need time to adapt. Uh, and so it's part of, uh, of the international experience to have uh, up and down. Yes, you, you have to take your time to adapt, uh, to understand another culture, environment, uh, to get exactly. used to. You, you it's a learning curve, like for everything. So it's a learning curve and it's up and down. But it's always, at the end, it's going, going up, so. <laughs> Any other questions from your side or from the Some audience? questions. Um, I think maybe we can conclude and go to the final evolution. What would you say? OK. I think maybe the the last question will be also for all speakers. Would you mind if uh, our participants will get in touch with you uh, if they have more questions on your specific position? Of course. Do it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Do not hesitate. Because you are your professional profiles are all very interesting, different but interesting. So. Uh, this is really a demonstration of the, the, the broad variety of alternative careers for PhD. So to conclude this day, I invite you, our audience to click through me. Ah, yes. Please read in the chat. We have already prepared a, a satisfactory service. So well, first of all, thank you to our speakers for this second round table. Um, for your insights and thank also representatives of, from the previous round table of, from companies um, for sharing information about your um, background, about the professional world in Italy, in France, and even beyond. It, and it was very fruitful and productive. It was very, with such precious contribution. Thank you for your yeah. really precious contribution, individual precious contribution, I would say, and, and insight. And also for the audience, I invite you to scan the QR code or the, the link that I just put in the chat box. Go on the Klaxoon. The system will ask you just for um, to fill in a nickname. And then you'll see our question questions in the seconds. It will be very quick, will be, but very useful also. It will take for you our... really few, a few minutes, but it will be of great help for us to improve uh, our uh, coming edition next year, maybe on site, hopefully on site. Yeah, so the first question is how would you rate your readiness for trying 
the networking approach. When you put one star if you're not ready and five stars if you're ready and gear, eager. Eager. And of course, you can also put your uh, feedbacks in the chat box. I already mm -hmm. see some of, your, some of your nice feedbacks. In the, in the chat, there are lots of um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the session were informative and encouraging. Many thanks from the public. I would like to thank the organizers and speakers for such an interesting for, inform, and for information and tips given. Yes, so I see what we, we can all see that there's some, the, the average note is quite good, 4.1. So it's good to start the networking, that you, to value your readiness for networking. So please continue answering this question. I will move to the second one. Also, the same, how would you rate your knowledge of company expectations and opportunities in the French Italian area? Once again, one star uh, not satisfying, sorry for the typo, mm -hmm. and five stars are uh, very, very satisfying. satisfying. And I can see also all of your thanks and thank you, of course, for your kind messages. Very much important for us also to know whether this um, informational French Italian day was uh, insightful for you. Well, the average note, well, it's still going up also. Yes. For now, it's 3.6. It's always, Yeah, well, it's more than um, the average, it's good. Uh, so please continue also answering this question and I will just launch the very last question just to see also a little bit of your qualitative feedback is this French Italian day for early career researchers just in one word. How would you describe what did you learn from this day or um, uh, whether it's inspired you, um, any word interesting in the first one. Hmm. Enhancing. Enhancing, informative, inspiring, helpful. Worrying, I hope. Worrying in a good way that you worrying slash motivating. You see, network wise, wonderful, helpful, goes on the first place. Reassuring. Okay, well, it's very funny to see that it's, it was advanced, worrying yes, and reassuring. Yes. Yeah. Well, hopefully we could help give them, so I insp inspire, inspire them on how, Absolutely. how to move, to do, to prepare their career, postdoctoral career pack, network-wise. Well, um, the time is up for this uh, year session. So once again, um, well, ABG, the University of Turin, the French Italian University, well, all, uh, and I think also our speakers uh, warmly thank participants and of course our speakers also for, um, for their insights and, um, we're very hoping to receive some of your feedbacks later on. If you have further questions, either to organizers or to speakers, really don't hesitate to network also with us. Um, Lucia, some few yes. last words. Yes, uh, 
Uh, oh, my gratitude goes to ABG for collaborating with us every year. This is, uh, and hopefully we will keep on collaborating and, and maybe organizing next year. So uh, finger cross and on site and on site because I believe I strongly believe in network, but I think that it works well when we are on site, and so we we miss we are missing so also these moments like coffee breaks uh, uh, so you can you can do you can you can practice <laughs> uh, when you are uh, and at work uh, uh, at the beginning of, uh, uh, of this experience and so um, thank you thank you very much to our speakers for the last session and for the previous session because for their for their important contribution for their tips uh, for sharing <clears throat> with us their interesting uh, uh, Path, career postdoctoral career path and demonstrating all the all career paths for PhD. There are really many many career paths for PhD. Interesting, uh, uh, original, uh, and uh, when you are highly skilled, it, it, it always pays off. Excellent. So thank you all and good luck in your professional uh, career planning to friends in Italy and beyond. So thank you and goodbye. Bye bye. Bye everyone. Adieu. Ciao. Bye. bye. Ciao. Yeah.